Welcome to this one lecture in the Winter Living Theology series. My name is Father David Neuhaus, and the title for this lecture is Learning to Read Backward from the Beginning. I'm not even going to try and explain what that means before we actually apply this title as an exercise in reading a text from the Gospel. The text that we're going to read is the very first text we encounter in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the text at the beginning of the New Testament. And as we shall see very importantly, it is the text at the crisp between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, my friends, let us read this text. I'll read it slowly so that it can penetrate. It is a text that we hear in the days leading up to Christmas, a text which I think many have a hard time with, so many complicated names, and what can it all possibly mean? That's what we'll be exploring in this lecture. So let's begin. An account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brothers. And Judah begat Peretz and Zerah by Tamar. And Peretz begat Hetzron, and Hetzron begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadav. And Aminadav begat Nachshon, and Nachshon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz begat by Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat King David. And David begat Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon begat Rehoboam. And Rehoboam begat Abiah. And Abiah begat Asaph. And Asaph begat Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat begat Yoram. And Yoram begat Uzziah. And Uzziah begat Yotam, and Yotam begat Ahaz, and Ahaz begat Hezekiah, and Hezekiah begat Manasseh, and Manasseh begat Amots, and Amots begat Josiah, and Josiah begat Yekoniah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon. Yekoniah begat Sha'altiel, and Sha'altiel begat Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begat Abihud, and Abihud begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Tzadok, and Tzadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Elihud, and Elihud begat Elazar, and Elazar begat Matan, and Matan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. And these are the first 17 verses of the Gospel of St. Matthew. They are the first 17 verses in the New Testament. And what do they mean? Not only what is the information that we are gathering, but also what are we being taught about reading the New Testament, I remind you, this course is about reading backwards from the beginning. And here we are at the beginning. So, first of all, let's very briefly talk about the historical critical context of this text. In other words, who wrote this text? 
For whom? When, where, and why? These are basic questions when we as modern readers of the biblical text approach the text. These are questions we ask, very important questions, in order to understand what is written. So, very briefly, because this will not be our focus, who wrote the text? We know tradition. Tradition tells us that this text was written by Matthew. Again, who is Matthew? Matthew, according to the New Testament, is one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. Needless to say, after studying the text with great depth, moderns now understand the text was probably written one or two generations after Matthew, perhaps by disciples of Matthew, a text that was probably written much later than the time of Matthew. For whom is Matthew writing? Well, clearly, he is writing for a group who believes that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the one for whom Israel had been waiting. And we can understand from reading the text that many in that community of Matthew would have been Jews who believed in Jesus, but certainly not all of them. As we know, the early church was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. The writer is writing in Greek for an audience that knows Greek. When was this text written? We don't have a very clear idea, but probably sometime in the 80s. Most probably a text that was written after Paul had written his epistles and after a first book of what we call gospel had been written by someone we know as Mark. Indeed, Matthew seems to repeat a lot of Mark, although he's not particularly a great fan of Mark. Where was this book written? We are not sure. Perhaps in greater Syria, perhaps for a Christian community in Antioch. We know that that was a very important city of early disciples of Jesus. And why was this book written? Well, clearly, the author wants to communicate to those who are listening or those who might one day read this book, who is Jesus, whom we call the Messiah, the Son of God? What is his teaching? And most importantly of all, how does he bring us into relationship with God, our Father? I'm not going to say anything more about the historical, critical context of this book. Much has been written. Much can be read. It is not the subject of this lecture. Now let's look at another aspect of context. Where is this book in our Bible? And as we all know, it is the first book of the New Testament, meaning it is placed exactly at the divide between the Old Testament and the New Testament, a very significant place. Of course, it was not Matthew who decided that that's where his book was to be placed. It would have been at a much later period when the canon of the Bible starts to evolve and the content of the Bible, the books that are in, is decided. And then not only that, but when the pages are bound together, a certain order is decided upon, and Matthew would then be the first text of the New Testament. This perhaps has a lot to do with Matthew's constant, explicit reference to the Old Testament. Those many books of the people of Israel precede, in the book of the Bible, the books of the New Testament. Matthew's constant, explicit reference to the Old Testament is very much underlined in the first two chapters of Matthew. And the text that we read, which are the first 17 verses, indeed make that very apparent, as we will discover in the course of this lecture. But to make this point even more explicit, I do want to cite some of the first words that we hear from the mouth of Jesus, who comes in the Gospel of Matthew, like 
a new Moses. Here you see this wonderful Byzantine icon of the transfiguration with Jesus there transfigured, standing between Elijah and Moses. In his first great sermon, the first of five, we hear Jesus say in chapter five, do not think that I have come to abolish the law, the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, let's also say a word about the context of this book of Matthew within the New Testament. Again, we have stated it's the first book, but also it's the first of the four books of the gospel. And the gospel is the first part of the New Testament. In fact, traditionally, we divide the New Testament into four parts. The gospel, history, wisdom, and prophecy. Some might not be familiar with this breakdown, so let's say again what we mean. We have four books of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have one book of history, the Acts of the Apostles, that talks about the history of the earliest community of believers, our mother church. Then we have 21 books that we might refer to as wisdom, written by the great teachers of the church those who come to teach us how to live according to the message of Jesus. 21 books written by, well, 14 of them by Paul. And then we have the book of James, two epistles attributed to Peter, three epistles attributed to John, and a final epistle to Jude. Yes, indeed, these 21 books are all of them written as epistles to the communities spread throughout the ancient world and addressed to us until today. And then finally, one book, a prophetic book, or perhaps more precisely, a book of apocalypse, the book of Revelation. Please note, as I'm sure that you have, that this fourfold breakdown of the New Testament corresponds to the traditional fourfold breakdown of the Christian Old Testament, gospel corresponding to Torah, the teaching. But the teaching in the New Testament become incarnate in Jesus. And then in the Old Testament, 16 books of history of the people of Israel. In the New Testament, one book of history of the church. And then in the Old Testament, seven books of wisdom. In the New, 21 epistles corresponding to biblical wisdom. And then the Old Testament, 18 books that are put into the section of prophecy in the New Testament, one book. This mirroring is a very important part of how Christians created what we have today in the Bible. And then, finally, let's look at the context within the Gospel of Matthew. We read the first 17 verses. Let's again remind ourselves of the structure of the Gospel of Matthew so that we can understand the place that this text that we will be focusing on, the first 17 verses, the place that these verses have in the overall book that Matthew wrote. So first of all, a general comment. There is a movement in the Gospel of Matthew, from Jews to all. What do I mean? Well, Jesus, the man from Nazareth, the one we recognize as Messiah, Savior, he came first of all to the Jews, very much underlined in the Gospel of Matthew. He is a Jew coming to the Jews to say, I am here. The Messiah you have been waiting for has arrived. 
the genealogy, of course, roots the story of Jesus in Israel, with only a hint of the nations, as we will see. But from the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew begins a movement that will end with the sending of Jesus' disciples as apostles to all nations, right at the end of the gospel. There is the command to go and baptize all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The rooting in Israel roots the New Testament in the old. And in order to understand the new, we constantly have to refer back to the old. The structure of Matthew, again, ancient literature tends to be very structured. And so here in this structure of Matthew, we are again dealing with the context in which we find the text that we are studying. The first two chapters are chapters that we tend to call an infancy gospel, dealing with the conception, the birth, and the childhood of Jesus chapters 1 and 2. In a second section, chapters 3 and 4, we have Jesus, now an adult, coming to the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist and thus initiate his public ministry. After that, in the Gospel of Matthew, and very particular to Matthew, we have in chapters 5 to 25, the body of of Jesus' mission, five great sermons. Many have pointed out that these five great sermons correspond to the five books of Moses in the Old Testament, for Jesus is coming to renew Moses' teaching and bring it to fulfillment in his own person. And then, as we know from the other books of the gospel, we have a description, long and detailed, of Jesus' passion as he comes to Jerusalem at the end of his life, is arrested, is put on trial, suffers as he goes carrying his cross to Golgotha, where he will die. And finally, chapter 28, a description of the victory over death, the victory over sin and darkness in Jesus' resurrection. So again, when we remind ourselves that the text we will be reading, we will be focusing on the text we have already heard, is part of the infancy gospel made up of that genealogy, the first 17 verses, and what remains in chapter 1 and 2, which is composed of five passages, each one based upon a citation from the Old Testament making absolutely clear that the new makes no sense without the old. The new is constantly sending us back to the old. And so, let us now focus on the text and try to grasp the deeper meaning of the text and how this text is teaching us to read backwards, always going back to the Old Testament to get the long hand of what is in real shorthand in the New Testament. And so let's read the text again. We'll be going through it slowly, focusing on particular features of the text that help us to understand the importance of what Matthew is writing. And so he begins his text with an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let's stop stop for a moment and just take account of if we had no idea of the writings of Israel, no idea of the Old Testament, what in fact would we understand? Well, perhaps, and maybe some Christians still think this, this is a story about a man whose name is Jesus. His family name is Christ. So, yes, he's the child of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. His father's name is David, and his grandfather's name is Abraham. Now, I'm sure that everyone here realizes that that's not what this text means. But in order to understand what it means, 
We need to read backward. And this is an exercise that prepares us for reading the whole of the New Testament as we are constantly called to read backwards. So let's break down this first verse into parts so that we can understand uh, what it means to read backwards. And so firstly, an account of the genealogy is written in one of our modern English translations. In fact, I've put here the verse in Greek. You hear, as you see there, genealogies are a type of genesis. And so in Greek, the words are biblos, geneseos. And I've translated the book of the genesis of Jesus, who is the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. For those who know the Old Testament well, we'll remember that we've already encountered that exact expression, biblos, geneseos, twice in the book of Genesis. A word about this, important. The texts of the Old Testament, for their great majority, were written in Hebrew. But our New Testament authors knew them in Greek and wrote in Greek, for Greek had become a very important language of Jews wherever they lived. So this expression we find the first time in Genesis 2.4. These are the generations, our translation says. But in fact, what is written there is, this is the book of the Genesis, Biblos Geneseos, of the heavens and the earth when they were created. That in fact appears at the beginning of chapter 2, where we are at the crisp between the first creation account and the second. Later on in chapter 5 of Genesis, we will again have this expression. This is the list of the descendants, our translation says. But once again, the same words are used. This is the book of the Genesis of Adam. When God created humankind, he made them in the likeness of God. Please note again that there in chapter 5, we have our first long genealogy of the descendants of Adam. And so when Matthew chooses these very words to initiate his own book, might he not be telling us that we are at a very important moment of recreation, of restoration of God's original creative intention. Here comes Jesus, whom Paul calls a new Adam. Now, what comes after that is the name of our central hero, Jesus, an account of the genealogy of Jesus. Now, those who Matthew is writing for, those who knew the Old Testament in Greek, would immediately identify this name Jesus as a well-known hero from the history of the people of Israel. In fact, Jesus in Greek is what we have in our Old Testaments as Joshua, translated from the Hebrew. Indeed, in Hebrew, Yehoshua. In Greek, Jesus. The story, of course, goes that Joshua was the one who inherited the role of Moses. But I want to read a particular text about Joshua that is very evocative of the first Joshua and the Joshua that we are now focusing on, who is known from his Greek name, Jesus, Joshua the son of Nun in the Old Testament, and Jesus the son of Mary in the New Testament. And in Numbers 27, when Moses is knowing that he will not lead the people into the land, that he will die on the east bank of the Jordan River. Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint someone over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, so that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep 
without a shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, or if we're reading as Matthew did, as many of the early Christians would have in Greek, what the Lord says to Moses is, take Jesus, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand upon him. Joshua in the Old Testament will become a new Moses, a leader of the people, in intimate relationship with God, walking in front of the people to lead them into the land of promise. Is this not exactly the role of Jesus, intimately in relationship with God, leading us into God's embrace? So the name is very evocative. And then there is the word Christ, not a family name. No, Jesus is not the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. For Christ is a well-known Old Testament term. In fact, we would say in English, rather than Christos in Greek, we would say Messiah, an account of the genealogy of Jesus, Christ, Christos, the Messiah. And what is the Messiah in the Old Testament? Well, let us remember that in certain texts in the Old Testament, there is a mediator anointed to ensure ongoing relationship between God and the people. The first time we come across this term in the Old Testament, when we read through the books of the Old Testament in the order that we have in our Christian Bibles, we would encounter that word, Messiah, Christos, in chapter 4 of the book of Leviticus. Again, the translation doesn't help us, but I have tried to make the connections that we should be able to make. In Leviticus 4.3, it talks about an anointed priest, a priest who has been anointed with oil, thus made a mediator, one who mediates the relationship between Israel and Israel's God. Yes, the word is that same word used in Greek Christos, in Hebrew, Mashiach. And this is what it says. If it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull of the herd without blemish as a sin offering to the Lord. Interesting. The priest here called the anointed one, the Messiah, is offering a sin offering. Later, in the historical books, we find that the Messiah, the anointed one, is a king. And so in 1 Samuel, for example, 1613, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, this is David, in the presence of his brothers and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day onward. Notice here in this text, the anointed one, the one appointed to be mediator, is not a priest, but a king. In fact, in another verse from the prophetic books in Isaiah 45, we encounter a shock because that word Mashiach, that word Christos is used, but this time not for a king from Israel, but for a Gentile king, the king of Persia, Cyrus, whose great act with regard to the biblical narrative will be to open the tomb, the tomb of exile, Babylon, where the people have been sent, deported there. We'll come back to that event in the text we have from Matthew. And so Cyrus who is about to open the door of the tomb, about to allow the people to return to Jerusalem, is called the anointed. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, who plays such a central role in the life of the people of God. And then, thirdly, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to be a herald of good tidings to the oppressed. This verse from the third part of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 
is a verse that we know only too well because in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus goes into the synagogue in Nazareth and takes the scroll of the book of Isaiah, it's this text that he reads. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Here, this is not a priest and not a king, but a prophet. Please notice, priest, king, prophet. Jesus as Messiah is also fulfilling these three very important roles in the life of the people of Israel. Three roles that are made explicit and focused upon in the Old Testament. But we are used to Christ, Messiah, being associated with some kind of eschatological end of days figure who comes as savior. Please notice until now we have not encountered that in the Old Testament. The anointed one is a priest, a king, and a prophet in the life of the people. But in a very late Old Testament text, the fourth of the prophetic books in our uh, Christian canon, we have the book of Daniel. And in chapter 9, that same word, Mashiach Christos, is used. And there, the text, written originally in Hebrew, says, Know therefore and understand from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the time of an anointed priest. The chap this chapter in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, is a difficult chapter to understand, for it talks of hidden things, of apocalyptic happenings, of a restoration. And within these proceedings, there is a Christ, a Messiah, a prince who is anointed. Again, please notice what we are doing in order to understand until now every expression in the Gospel of Matthew. We are reading backward into the Old Testament to derive from there the fuller meaning that can only be learnt from going back constantly to the Old Testament. Let us continue, for Jesus is not only the Christ, the Messiah, but he is also the son of David, and we know full well that that does not mean that his biological, familial father is David. He is the son of David because that has deep significance if we can identify who David is, the beloved king in the Old Testament. I bring you two texts that underline the importance of David. One, a particularly important text for the New Testament, chapter 7. For there it is written, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. The context here is that David has brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and would like to build a big temple like his own palace for God. But God says, no, 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 I don't want you to build me a temple. I will establish for you a temple, a kingdom, a dynasty for your offspring after you will establish. I will establish his kingdom. And then about this offspring, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I'm sure we all remember that David indeed had a son who did indeed build a temple. His name was Solomon. But here there is something strange in the text. For God says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, that didn't happen with Solomon. Solomon's kingdom would be destroyed, divided and destroyed. So perhaps here we might suggest that the text is intimating that there will be another son of David. The text continues, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod, such as mortals use with blows inflicted by human beings. Well, that would be 
what would happen with Solomon. But the one that we know comes to be on a throne that lasts forever will not be Solomon, son of David, but another son of David, an eschatological son of David, perhaps one that is described in the book of Isaiah chapter 9. For there we read, For a child has been born for us, a child given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Again, a prophetic text expecting a child, a child from the dynasty of David, a son of David, who will be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Certainly, Matthew would like us to have these texts in mind when we read that this Jesus, who is the Christ, is the son of David. And then finally, not only son of David, but son of Abraham, not Jesus' grandfather, but a very important figure in the establishment of the people, in fact, the father of the people. So here again, we go to the two texts in the book of Isaiah to understand the importance of Jesus at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew being called son of Abraham in Isaiah 41. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called you from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Or a little further, in that same second part of the book of Isaiah, listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. Jesus, a son of Abraham, continuing that vocation of Abraham to be blessing, not just continuing, but perfectly fulfilling that commandment to Abraham. Be blessing. Again, I want to point out before we move on how absolutely essential it is to read backwards. That first verse of the Gospel of Matthew, which is the first verse of the New Testament, makes no sense unless we can call to mind the richness of the relationship between God and the people of Israel described in the Old Testament, and rooting Jesus in the story of Israel, the text then begins with a genealogy, a genealogy that is basically composed of a continuity. Let's read it again without all the extras, just that genealogy that takes us from Abraham to Jesus. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judah, Judah begat Peretz and Zerah, Peretz begat Hezron, Hezron begat Aram, Aram begat Aminadav, Aminadav begat Nachshon, Nachshon begat Salmon, Salmon begat Boaz, Boaz begat Oved, Oved, Oved begat Jesse, Jesse begat David, David begat Solomon, Solomon begat Rehoboam, Rehoboam begat Aviyah, Aviyah begat Asaph, Asaph begat Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begat Yoram, 
Yoram begat Uziah. Uziah begat Yotam. Yotam begat Ahaz. Ahaz begat Hezekiah. Hezekiah begat Manasseh. Manasseh begat Amos. Amos begat Josiah. Josiah begat Jeconiah. Jeconiah begat Shaltiel. Shaltiel begat Zerubavel. Zerubavel begat Avihud. Avihud begat Eliakim. Eliakim begat Azor. Azor begat Sadok. Sadok begat Achim. Achim begat Elihud. Elihud begat Elazar. Elazar begat Matan. Matan begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Joseph. And so we arrive at Jesus. Needless to say here, what Matthew is underlining is that continuity of a seed that brings us to Jesus. It is this, the family. The family of Israel, beginning with Abraham, who established the line of Israel all the way to Jesus. From Abraham, the father of Israel, through David and Josiah, father of Yekoniah, to Joseph, the son of Jacob. You noticed I divided it into three groups, this genealogy that flows on. For indeed, Matthew will underline the perfect symmetry of God's plan that leads to Jesus. 14, 14, 14. The importance given to that perfect symmetry is revealed in the additions to the text that now I want to look at closely. You remember, of course, that when we read the text the first time, there were all kinds of exceptions to the simplicity of a father begetting a son. Let's look closely now at those exceptions. And I start with something that perhaps you didn't even notice, but there is a first exception to the simple unit, a father begets a son, in two places in the text where it says, and let's read those verses again, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brothers. Nowhere else are brothers mentioned except in one other place, and that's later in verse 11. And Josiah begat Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. Now, one of the striking things about this text is that it focuses simply on a list of names, for the most part. No historical events are mentioned. Among the greatest historical events, of course, would be the meeting of the people at Sinai with their God, the receiving of the Torah. Not mentioned in this text. But by adding twice in the genealogy, and his brothers, our attention is drawn to these particular generations. Now, I hope that you remember, and if not, I help you with that memory. At the time of Jacob begetting Judah and his brothers, the people left the land of Israel and went to Egypt, where they stayed for 400 or more years a big part of that being slaves to Pharaoh. It will be a mighty act of God that will bring the people out of Egypt in order to come to the land and possess it. So that's a first and his brothers reminding us of Egypt and the greatness of God in Egypt. And then a second time when it talks about brothers is at the time of Josiah, the just king, begatting Jeconiah and his brothers, among them very unjust, unfaithful kings. And this is at the time of the deportation to Babylon. Indeed, and his brothers reveals to us moments when the people are led out of the land and will be brought back by the power of God. So, no events mentioned, but events implied if we know to read backwards. Egypt and Babylon being extremely important moments 
in the memory of the people, a people of slaves, becoming a freed people when God leads them out in order to go to the land. Babylon, a moment of death in a tomb of exile, deported, and a moment of rebirth. Further exceptions. This I'm sure many of you have noticed before. Exceptions to a father begets his son include the names of certain mothers. Let's read those verses. And Judah begat Peretz and Zerah by Tamar, the first woman mentioned. And Salmon begat Boaz by Rahab, a second woman mentioned. And Boaz begat Oved by Ruth, a third woman mentioned. And then David begat Solomon by the wife of Uriah, the name not mentioned, but a very important event evoked. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. Now, what is going on here with the mention of these names of certain women? Again, in order to understand at least four of them, we need to go backwards, read back into the Old Testament, and remember the stories of these women. I might say, and I'll explain hopefully in the next few moments what I mean, these are all problem women. Tamar played the prostitute. You can go back to the book of Genesis and read her story as she is tricked by her father-in-law. So she tricks him, Tamar. A little knot in the story, reminding us of the very, very human story that is told in the long generations from Abraham to Jesus. Tamar is most likely a Gentile woman who is married into Israel. And then a second woman, Rahab. Tamar plays the prostitute in order to get back at her father-in-law and have justice. But Rahab is a prostitute, a Canaanite prostitute. But Rahab is the one who lets the people into the land. She is the one who recognizes in the people the great acts of God. She is the one who hides the two spies and then brings salvation at least to her own house, if not to all the people in Jericho. For knowing that God is with the people of Israel, knowing that the people of Israel are about to enter the land, she makes the spies promise that they will save her and her household. They tell her, bring everyone into your house. Put a scarlet thread so that when we identify your house, those in it will not suffer the destruction that will be wrought on Jericho. I like to think that everyone came into the house of Rahab because of her faith in the God of Israel. And then the next woman, Ruth. Ruth, we remember, a whole book dedicated to her among the historical books in the Old Testament. Ruth, a surprising figure. <laughs> Ruth is a Moabite. Moabites not only are not Israelites, they are not only a foreign people, but in the book of Deuteronomy, it is written that they must never be allowed to come into the people of Israel. But Ruth, because of her faith and her fidelity to her mother-in-law, not only becomes a member of the people of Israel, but she becomes the great-grandmother of King David. Ruth the Moabite brings blessing into the midst of the people of Israel, brings light, the light of her faith, to the town of Bethlehem. And there begins the preparations over a number of generations for the birth of David. Interestingly here, Matthew gives us a piece of information, or perhaps more a theological datum, that Rahab and Ruth have the relationship of mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, a very interesting addendum that we get 
from the Gospel of Matthew. Rahab the Canaanite prostitute, woman of faith, brings salvation to her people. Ruth, a Moabite, destined to be excluded from e- forever from the people of God, comes right into the midst of the people of God, and from her descendants will be born David. And then we come to the fourth woman, wife of Uriah. We know her name. Her name is Bathsheba. But why is she named here as the wife of Uriah? Well, indeed she was. And because of the terrible sins of David, Uriah was killed. A very big knot in the story. Solomon, begotten by David from the wife of a man who David had put to death. Again, we can remember that story by going back and reading the second book of Samuel, a very difficult moment in the life of God's beloved King David. And finally, the woman we know only too well, for she is Jesus' mother and ours, Mary. But notice the knot again at the end of this long generation where father begets son. Right at the end, that very important uh, process where a father begets a son is interrupted when Joseph is described as the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. A word about this. Joseph is indeed the father of the child who is born, but God intervenes so that he is not biologically the father. God intervenes so that Jesus is the son of God, but Joseph will be called to play the role of father. Without Joseph, there will be no Jesus, for Mary might be put to death for being pregnant without yet being with her husband, Joseph. And a series of events in the rest of chapter 1 and 2 in the Gospel of Matthew show how important it is that Joseph is on the sea. Joseph, the man who communicates with God through dreams, is indeed a father to Jesus. One more important difference. A father begets a son. You might have noticed that in the long line of kings that follow the mention of Jesse begat David, only David is called king. And Jesse begat King David. I think here again, Matthew is drawing our attention to the history of kingship in Israel, a tragic history. For God did not want God's people to have any other king than God. Indeed, that people went out of Egypt singing, God will reign over us forever. The song of the sea. Moses taught to the people as they crossed over the sea. And that song is to be found in Exodus 15. God's kingship is what characterizes Israel. They are to be the kingdom of God. But we know that looking around at the nations, Israel is constantly tempted and tempted also to make kings over themselves. Yes. The story of kingship in Israel will be for the most part tragic. And David is mentioned again, having begotten Solomon from the wife of Uriah as a sinful king. If David is great, it is because he can hear, and you see in the illustration here, Nathan coming to David and telling the parable the parable that will awaken David to a moment of rage and judgment, not yet realizing that he's judged himself as a terrible sinner. Nathan's parable of the rich man who takes away the poor man's beloved ewe lamb and makes him into a meal for the guests that are visiting. David says that man must die, and only then Does David realize that that's what he's done by ripping Bathsheba away from Uriah? 
And when Uriah will not cover up David's adulterous sin, David has Uriah slaughtered. The history of kingship is not a glorious history, for God must be king in Israel. In fact, in chapter 2, the king we encounter in Israel, Herod, will seek to destroy, to kill Jesus himself. And as collateral damage, will destroy and kill all the babies born in Bethlehem, a real pharaoh, one from whom the people must be liberated. But Jesus, the Messiah, is our king, for indeed, we must proclaim only God as king. That little word added into the genealogy makes us reread the history of kingship in Israel. And again, it is a story deeply intertwined with human sin. Finally, one last addition before we deal with the problematic ending of the genealogy. One more exception to that unit father begets son and a very important addition. In chapter 11, we hear about Josiah who begat Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. I have always told those I teach, after that verse, verse 11, we must pause, a long, pregnant pause. The deportation to Babylon implies the death of the people of Israel. Of course, because of sin, this son of God Israel in the Old Testament, Israel is called the Son of God. Uh, this Son of God, the entire people of Israel, has died and been buried in the tomb of Babylon. After reading the words in, in verse 11, Josiah begat Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. Stop. Pause. Recognize the catastrophe. This is a kind of holy Saturday. The Son of God, the people of Israel, has been buried in exile. It is only after a long pregnant pause that we should read in verse 12 and after the deportation to Babylon. Indeed, and after the deportation to Babylon. This significant word here is after, for there is no after death. Death is the end. Death is a finality after which there is nothing in the natural world. That word after, very simple, banal word, implies the greatness of God God intervening in history so that God can be faithful to God's people, that God, through God's people, can recognize God's plan. The plan is, according to this text in Matthew, to arrive at the Jesus moment. But without God's direct in intervention, bringing the people back to the land, allowing Jerusalem to be rebuilt, these events that are described at the beginning of the book of Ezra are the extremely significant pointers to a God of the resurrection. Notice in this etching, I have put a picture that represents the valley of the dry bones. There is Ezekiel calling out, breathing onto these bones that take flesh and rise up. This is the dead people of Israel rising up at the time of Cyrus to go out of the tomb and back to Jerusalem to rebuild the holy city. God is renewing God's covenant, renewing God's people in an act of resurrection. Notice we are just at the beginning of Matthew, but that that word after already points to the end of Matthew, to the very basis of what we believe as Christians, that Jesus, in Jesus' resurrection, has conquered death, has put an end to the reign of darkness and sin. 
This is what the prophets of old have foretold. This is what the people of Israel, in a certain sense, experienced with the return from exile. And this is what Jesus makes absolutely explicit in his resurrection, showing us our destiny. And so, you see, these exceptions are a very important part of the text, deepening our understanding when we read backwards. We read again the Old Testament that sheds light on the new. Well, we're not yet finished because the last verse of the genealogy is a break. There is a break with the regularity of a father who begets a son. What is happening at the end? Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Notice there's a break there. And it focuses, as we see in the continuation, the second part of chapter 1 and chapter 2, on this figure, Joseph. By the way, notice, number one, Joseph is a son of Jacob. It's written in the genealogy, Jacob begat Joseph. Now, my friends, this is not the first time in our biblical story that we've met a Joseph, son of Jacob. You remember the genealogy began with Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and in the genealogy it was written, Jacob begat Judah and his brothers. But the most significant narrative figure among the brothers of Judah, the sons of Jacob, is Joseph. And do you remember that Joseph? Well, first and foremost, he appears as a dreamer. That Joseph at the end of Genesis, he has dreams that make his brothers furious, but that save his life in prison and finally save the life of all of his brothers and family. Joseph is a dreamer in the Old Testament. And Joseph in the New Testament is a dreamer. We must read Joseph in the New Testament on the background of Joseph in the Old. For Joseph's dreams lead Joseph into the central role as father of Jesus. Those dreams lead him, first of all, to understand that the child in Mary's womb is the Son of God. That child is the future of the people of Israel. And so Joseph, instead of quietly putting aside Mary, who he found to be pregnant, takes her into his home and thus becomes not only her protector, but the father of the child he is called to name. Indeed, naming is the primary fatherly duty in the Old Testament. Not procreation, not begatting biologically. Anyone can do that. But naming, taking responsibility for and protecting <clears throat> That is the role of Joseph, the son of Jacob, in the, Old, in the New Testament. So Joseph is a dreamer. Second, notice, Joseph, son of Jacob in the Old Testament, goes down to Egypt. In fact, he goes down to Egypt because of the violence of his brothers. He goes down to Egypt as a slave. But, as he will describe it at the end of the book of Genesis, this will be the will of God to save God's people. For you have done evil, Joseph says to his brothers, but God has turned it into good. For Joseph in the Old Testament will become a savior figure, providing food and shelter for his family in their hour of need. Notice in the New Testament as well, Joseph, son of Jacob, goes down to Egypt. He has a dream that tells him, you need to get out of here. Herod is sending his soldiers to kill the babies. Take the child and its mother and go down to Egypt. By doing so, Joseph, son of Jacob, protects not only Mary and Jesus, but the very future of the whole people of God, all of God's children who will recognize in Jesus their Messiah and Savior. And then Joseph, son of Jacob, 
in Egypt, in the Old Testament, gets into trouble with a woman. We all remember that disturbing story of his boss's wife who tries to seduce him, the wife of Potiphar. Indeed, Joseph, son of Jacob, gets into deep trouble that will put him in prison. Again, all part of a plan of God that will lead him to be a savior. Now, Joseph, son of Jacob in the New Testament, also to a certain degree gets into trouble with a woman. She's a troubling woman. She's pregnant before she lives with him. Again, all part of God's plan. And Joseph, by listening closely to the word of God, by being an exemplary son of Israel, listening to the word that comes to him in his dreams, for he is a dreamer, will understand his role in the story and a very important role it is. And finally, as we come towards the end of this study, we have another parallelism between Joseph, son of Jacob in the old, and Joseph, son of Jacob in the new. Joseph, son of Jacob in the old, is a father who is not a father. Look at this wonderful painting of Rembrandt, Jacob blessing Ephraim and Manasseh. And who are Ephraim and Manasseh? They are the children of, we might say, Joseph. But in fact, let's read the text that shows that no, Joseph has become a father who is not a father through the act of his elderly father, Jacob, who is there sitting up in his bed just before he dies. Therefore, Jacob says to Joseph, who has come to visit him on his deathbed, therefore your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are now mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are. As for the offspring born to you after them, they shall be yours. They shall be recorded under the names of their brothers with regard to their inheritance. They shall be recorded. Ephraim and Manasseh will now be considered sons of Jacob, sons of Israel receiving inheritance in the land like all of the other sons of Israel, sons of Jacob, Judah, and all his brothers. Now, this is a very interesting text. This text from chapter 48 of the book of Genesis shows us that the first Joseph, son of Jacob, is a father who is not a father. His own father has made him not a father to these two children. Does this not also prepare us for Joseph, son of Jacob, in the new? For he is not the father of Jesus from a biological, natural point of view. No, the child in Mary's womb is born from the Holy Spirit. But he is a father, a very real father to Jesus, for without him, Jesus would not have been born. Mary would have been stoned as an adulteress. And when he would have been born, he would have been slaughtered with the other innocents in the town of Bethlehem. Or had he survived that and Joseph had taken him to Egypt, he would not have returned from Egypt. No, he would have stayed there and not fulfilled his destiny. Or had he indeed come back into the land, they would have gone back to the orbit of a son of Herod who would have endangered the life of the child, and so Joseph instead takes him to Nazareth. At four junctures, Joseph has dreams that make him fully the father of Jesus, for without him there would be no Jesus. Without him, Jesus, not born from his seed, would not have even emerged from his mother's womb. Again, very important messages that can only be learnt. And that's what we've been doing in this lecture, which I now conclude, could only have been learnt had we learnt to read backwards. As we read the New Testament, going on from this first text, Matthew 1, 1 to 17, that's all we've done in this past hour and a bit, is looking at that text and seeing 
how intensively, how intentfully the text points us back to the scriptures of Israel. For indeed, our language in the New Testament would make no sense were it not for its rootedness in the long history experience of the people of Israel in the Old Testament. For this reason, of course, the church has always insisted that the Old and the New form one book of the scriptures of the church. So I come to the end of the lecture and insist that we must learn to read backwards and the beginning teaches us how to do that. That's the exercise that we have done. And let's conclude with one more citation from the Gospel of St. Matthew. Right at the center, at the end of chapter 13, the end of Jesus' third great sermon. He has five of them, as we pointed out in the Gospel of Matthew, and the fact that this is the third makes it the central one. Right at the end, he says, Jesus, and he's saying to us, to his disciples, and he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The newness that Jesus is can only be understood if we understand the fabric out of which Jesus is woven, the scriptures of Israel in the old. So, thank you for being with me. Thank you for learning together. I do, in a last slide, want to give credit where credit is due to one of the great theologians and exegetes of our modern times and give you a reference to a wonderful book that he has written that has inspired me to go deeper and deeper into the understanding of the relationship between the old and the new. His name is Richard Hayes, and he wrote a wonderful book published in 2014 called Reading Backwards, Figural Christology and the Fourfold Gospel Witness. I quote him right at the end of this talk. We learn to read the Old Testament by reading backwards from the Gospels. And at the same time, we learn to read the Gospels by reading forwards from the Old Testament. Thank you very much for being with me.